what I'm going to try and do is put a couple of uh, exercises during uh, this lecture. Uh, it would be useful if you had a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, um, if you've got it. If not, maybe you can uh, uh, borrow off each other or something. Okay. So I'll, I'll introduce myself properly in a second. Can I turn the lights off here? No, that'll do. I'll introduce myself properly in a second, but uh, basically I've been working in the, the field of engineering design and product development for quite a number of years, both in research and practice. Um, and I understand you guys are from civil engineering or um, construction site. So I've, I've done a, a working with a couple of people uh, from construction. Um, and I think there's some value in transferring some of the, the learnings with regards to robust design and tolerance engineering from product development over to the construction industry. So uh, what I'm going to start with is a presentation from the Trabant Motor Company. It's a, an East German uh, manufacturing company quite a number of years ago. But in some ways, you might recognize the approach to quality engineering from this video and how it relates to the construction industry. And, would you mind just pushing play here? And if you can't see it, it the video quality is not great. But sorry for that. So this is how Trabant <coughs> used to maintain the quality of their product. Nothing particularly unusual so far, but here we go. So now what he's trying to do here is try to maintain the parallelity of the split lines that's running down the, the car just to make sure it's all assembled correctly. Now he's gauging whether the bonnet of the car is uh, closing flushly or whether there's some resistance or friction or there's some funny noise. He suspects there is, so he's tapping certain contact points, checking the edges aligned, denting the bumper in too far, he's pulling it back out. Uh, so I think this is kind of the where we are in the construction industry and for various good reasons and there was you know at the time of Trabant that probably wasn't a bad way to go about things it was in uh, East Germany so that there was need to be uh, production jobs for people uh, they didn't need to be shipping many components in from different places it was all assembled in one factory and maybe that was the appropriate quality paradigm for where they were at the time but then of course after sort of 1960s and going forward, we were much more into an industrialized uh, world where we were shipping parts from all different places where everything had to be interoperable. And in product development and automotive industry, we had to control tolerances of the parts because we want to be able to assure it, almost, well, digitally assure it now, so that when they come together, it all fits and works perfectly without the need to do this human-led adjustment. So I'm just wondering, I'm going to present to you how we've made that shift in the product development industry and work out, is there some opportunities to do the same in the construction industry? As we move more towards prefab buildings, modular constructions, where we want minimal uh, assembly and, and overrun delays, we want things to come together exactly how it's planned on the drawing board. So a little bit about me. I, um, I've basically uh, mechanical engineering uh, by trade, uh, started researching and doing my PhD in design engineering, then started working more towards product development and then also technology entrepreneurship. Um, I started up a, a, a research group on robust design and robust design is about how to design products that are insensitive to variation. Now in other words, if you can imagine the variation of the different components that are coming into the assembly we can actually make some mistakes or some improvements during the design of it to make it less sensitive to these variations. 
so that when we put it together, it actually performs or looks relatively consistent. I'll come to a bit more about that in a moment. Now, the best analogy that I can think of for this robust design is if we consider a special chair. And this chair that we're designing now only has one functional requirement. And that functional requirement is that the chair must not rock from side to side more than one millimeter. So the rock in this direction must not be more than one millimeter. So that's what the voice of the customer has required, this industrial collaborator. And the architect comes up with a, a design that looks a little bit like this. Now, if we're to put some specifications onto this drawing, some dimensions and tolerances, because now we need to send this over to manufacturing to be produced. What do we need to control in manufacturing in order to prevent the chair from wobbling more than one millimeter? So can anybody tell me what dimensions do we need to control on this drawing? Sorry? The thickness of this wooden base? Is that what you mean? Um, that's probably not one that will make too much difference, but it might in terms of the rigidity. Uh, I'm talking about the wobble from the, uh, the ground, from the legs on the ground. Length of the legs, of course. So if any one of these legs is longer than the other, it will start to wobble. What else do we need to control? Well, that's not a bad idea. Uh, but on this particular diagram, what do we need to control? The relative height of the feet. Yeah, the thickness of the feet. Anything else? Yeah. Exactly. So there's even a noise factor here, which is the, the parallelity of the floor, or the planarity of the floor, I should say. And of course, we've got the angle of the legs. Because if the same length but different angle, it will wobble. We've also got these bracket connections. So if the seat base here isn't plain, uh, planar, the front legs will be at a different angle to the back. So basically, there are a lot of tolerances we need to control on this. So perhaps length of legs, angle of legs, flatness of seat, flatness of ground, which we can't even control. And of course, a better solution to this would be nicely uh, spoiled by the host there. <laughs> we can go to a three-legged chair. In which case, what parameters do we have to actually control to meet the function requirement now? Basically none. Yeah, so if any of those change length within the re relative range of a tolerance, it won't affect it, nor the angle, nor the flatness of the seat. So what have we done from going from here to here? We've increased the robustness of the design or reduced its sensitivity to variation. Now, the this is a, uh, a simple equation that tells you about quality engineering. And basically, the performance variation or the quality of a design is related to two things. How much the parameters vary. In this case, a parameter would be length of legs and how sensitive the design is. Now, you were talking about lean, and when you do a, a, quite often when you do a lean course, it's often lean and Six Sigma, reducing waste, but also removing variation. Now, Six Sigma, all it does is focus on trying to eliminate parameter variation. So we try and to basically uh, reduce the, the distribution of our production to something like this and make sure it's bang on the, the line so we're getting a high CPK value or a high sigma value. But quite often, it's very expensive, it's very time consuming, it's very late stage. Now what we can do during the design phase for very little cost, just a bit of good understanding of design practice, is do some robust design and reduce the sensitivity of the design. Sometimes it can have a greater effect than huge, long-winded, expensive approaches in Six Sigma. Does that make sense? Okay. So <clears throat> now to take a step into the um, 
the pains that industry are feeling. Now, you can see these headline uh, news stories. So this one is a, um, some crashes from uh, GM, General Motors cars, due to a failure in an ignition switch. And basically what was happening, the ignition switch was, was kind of on, and then while they were going down the motorway, the ignition would drop into the accessory position. And what people would say, well, big deal, what's, what's so bad about that? But what was actually happening was the power steering was cutting out. Um, also, the power-assisted brakes would cut out. And also, the airbag cut out. So then, basically, when there was a, a fault or a crash, uh, it, it led to serious problems. Now, there are, of course, there's lots of problems with this particular case. But you could ask, why was the ignition switch key able to go from the on position to the accessory without the user doing it? And this is where they didn't have control of the amount of variation within the design of the switch. And it meant that the force at some point of the keychain would be able to overcome the resistance pulling it back, and it would jump into the accessory position. So it's just bad robustness. We wrote an article about this case. So my, my question is why was the safety feature related to inspection, the, the, the electric condition of the engine, or you know, the main system? Or the, if something happens to that, you want to somehow... Very, yeah. It's a good question. So there are, I mean, it's a, a very, nice, very nice case, and we've written a whole journal article on it. Um, the thing about um, these, these cars is this is from uh, this ignition switch is from a sub supplier. And they try to basically have platform architectures so they can put the same ignition switch in, in numerous vehicles and accept the vehicles change in terms of their electronics. And if you don't have a, um, a constant sort of fault tree FMEA detection of what are the implications of each you fall into trouble. And they made that mistake for one, they didn't have a good systems overview of their, their designs across their portfolio. Uh, but if you just look at the design of the ignition switch, that had robust design flaws in. That's the bit I was particularly interested in. Now, those, those complaints and those newspaper headlines, we say are the tip of the iceberg. These are where customer complaints come in. We have in-market service problems we have pro uh, product recalls. This is where, I mean, we draw the water line here because this is where the product has actually ended up in the hands of the customer. In construction industry, this will be when you've turned over the keys of the construction uh, and you've handed over the building and, you know, the, the doors don't close, the windows don't align, these kinds of uh, panels are warping and so on. But what we notice, what really hurts the product development industry aren't these things because they have a very strong quality control filters here. What the, many of the Danish companies feel, they have a lot of rework. So this means they ask for the components to be produced, they send them to the automated assembly lines and realize, or the assembly lines, and they realize the components don't fit as they intended. So they have to send them back for remanufacture or rework. I suspect this happens a lot in the construction industry as well except you plan to do rework and adjustment on site. You have high scrap rates, so many of the components fail and don't work. We have to have increased quality control and inspection, meaning we can't trust that these things will be assembled correctly, so we have to do many more measurements and many more quality controls. We have launch delays. We have increased R&D costs, meaning sending it back to the R&D team to redimension and so on. We have tight tolerances on components variation in the performance, so if we're building a thousand of these or a million of these, each one will perform or look slightly differently. We have wrong use of R&D resources and low innovation height. Low innovation height often comes because it was so damn hard to get it right in the last innovation project we had. Let's keep the majority of it the same. Let's not touch that sub-assembly. Keep it exactly the same <coughs> because it was so difficult to ramp up. You don't have control of variation and robustness. You're scared to change anything. Now, when we looked into a, a consumer electronics company, this is some of the research we did. At the point the design was frozen, we'd expect 100% of the R&D resources to be used. And then once the design is frozen and passed to manufacture, let's be fair, maybe there are some 
unforeseen things, so we need to do a few tweaks. So maybe 100% is used here, and then an additional 20% of the budget is used during the production phase. But when we follow different uh, projects, we realize that in some cases, 500% of the R&D budget was being used after the R&D work was supposed to all be finished. In other words, R&D had finished the drawings, sent them to production, and then they had to spend five times as long correcting all their mistakes. Now, it's very anecdotal, but when we applied some of our robust design approaches in the next project, at least it fit a curve which we could accept a little bit more. But very anecdotal evidence. Now, you could ask, well, these projects that have gone completely awry here, um, was, was it really to do with robust design that the problem was? Well, when you have, and I don't know whether the practice is the same in construction, but in product development, when you send, freeze the drawings, you send it for production, and then they need to make a change, they have to make what's called a change record or a change note. This is an official uh, change to a dimension or a material or part of the specification. So in this company, we just analyzed all of those change notes and said, of these change notes that were occurring in these phases, what were their nature? And it turned out that basically 32% of them were related to mechanical interface issues between components, between two or more components. And 31% were related to a mismatch between the process capabilities that the production system could cope with and the tolerances specified by the designer. So in other words, the designer was uh, attributing too tight a tolerance that the production unit could not meet. Um, I'll, come, I'll come back to them, and I, th I think, but a simple one that I'll come back to later is just simply, you know, if you, if you need a, this lid to press on or pull off, have a holding force of, let's say, t 10 newtons, well, you need to specify a certain tolerance in this cap in the molding. During the molding, it must not expand by more than, you know, 0.1 of a millimeter, Otherwise, it will no longer be able to hold the press on force. And if you specify too tight a tolerance, the production, when they're molding this, they can't meet that tolerance, meaning all the lids fall off or all the lids can't be pushed on. Now, when we've been applying robust design, it doesn't matter what industry we're looking at, we can apply the same tools and methods. So we can be in applying it to Rolls-Royce, uh, airplane engines, and what they're really concerned with is they don't want to go and do more rework on their uh, turbine blades. It's expensive stuff. Their components are incredibly expensive, and it takes them a long time, a lot of expense. A company like GKN Aerospace do composite wing sections, and they have a problem that when they decide, a bit like the construction industry, when they decide they're going to build something, they have to build it. And if they've accepted a specification that is too demanding, too tight tolerances, uh, too tight requirements of their quality, they have to burden the cost of it. And that's basically what GKN have to put up with. A company like Vestas, they have these offshore wind turbines. And if any of those wind turbines have unscheduled maintenance, one is we have to go out to sea and replace a, uh, a bearing, which is, you know, uh, hundreds of meters into the, the uh, above sea level, Two, the wind turbine isn't producing any electricity anymore. So we have a huge cost because of unscheduled maintenance. So when you're putting bearings into 100 wind turbines and you design them to last 10 years, but some of them only last six months and some of them last 20 years, we've got a problem, and that's related to robust design. A medical company, which I've done a lot of work with, Nova Nordisk, want predictability. They produce extremely expensive drugs. And if the device, the injection pen, is not ready in time to deliver that drug, then it's sitting on the shelf and burning money for that company. A commodity packaging firm like Crown Packaging need extremely high yield. If they have any scrap, it's cutting into their profit. And then a very high-end uh, uh, audiovisual company like Bang & Olsen need to make sure that their customers have the absolute premium quality experience. Because if they don't, that's their entire reputation down the drain. 
Now, it doesn't matter what, what area we're looking at, it's the same tools and methods that apply. It's just slightly different motivations. A little exercise for you now. What is this product here? And would you say it's a, a high quality product? Sorry? The, the writing on it suggests that. Go on, and what, which part? The Rolexes. Rolex, exactly. <laughs> so, what else gives it a feel for quality? More so if we, if we hid the Rolex sign, would you still think it was a good quality watch? So here it says Swiss made. That's a reputation thing as well. Here it says chronometer. And chronometer basically means this watch can hold time to a certain accuracy and therefore it's chronometrically certified. The number? The, the six positions? Serial number alone. Oh, right, the serial number. Uh, possibly. Yep. I'm not sure where to put that. Okay. Now, there's also some intrinsic quality things like 18 uh, rubies and so on. Now, I'll come back to some of the finer details of this watch in a second, but why do you think Rolex got the reputation for a top quality watch manufacturing company? How do you think they earned that reputation? Say again? They do something better. Yep, but what would it be? I mean, why do you gain a reputation for high quality mechanical watches? What could possibly give them that reputation? It's basically precision engineering. It's precision engineering. So what, what does it give to the customer? Robust, reliable product. Which is what in this case? Accurate, accurate timekeeping. Okay, so accurate timekeeping. Any watch is absolutely accurate twice a day. When it's broken at least. Consistency. So it's consistency, yeah. So basically accuracy is correct, but more, more to the point is consistency. Uh, and then, of course, marketing. But I think it's all built on the foundation that when you started to build mechanical watches, you wanted to be able to boast a watch that would hold time day after day after day. And this is basically what robustness is. And due to that quality of the build, built their reputation for a quality watch manufacturer. Now, there are some things which are things that are its brand name, it's Swiss made, it's number, it's serial number, the number of rubies on, that give you a sense that it is good quality. But there are some things related to the quality of its build and its design, like its calibration, that it's chronometrically certified, and that it's timed with six positions. That give you a sense that this watch is extremely well designed and made. Have a read of this, in particular, this part here. Well, actually, just read this. This is what comes with every Rolex watch, mechanical watch. You done? Okay. <coughs> So this is this bit timed in six positions. This means that it can keep time 
to the chronometric certification in no matter what orientation of the six it's laid in. That means if you take it off at night time, and you, this isn't a Rolex, unfortunately. Um, if you put it this orientation, or this orientation, or this orientation, or this orientation, or that, or that, it will keep the time. Now, why would that make any difference, the orientation of the watch? Why should that affect how well it keeps time? Um, but why would the position of it ha affect its timekeeping? Presumably because it's mechanical and gravity is involved. Exactly. It's, it's mechanical. There's gravity on the components. It will adjust the time. Now, this tells us here that even a Rolex isn't perfectly robust. But it's predictable. They know exactly how this Rolex will perform, and they will know exactly in which... That uh, aspect it's not robust and you can use it as a compensation technique. Now at DTU, uh, the university I work at, we have basically a three-step process to achieving quality. First increase predictability, then decrease sensitivity and then allocate tolerances. Uh, now there's a lot of uh, German inst uh, institutes we collaborate with who are incredibly good at this tolerance up allocation stuff, so we tend to focus on the, uh, the first two. I'm going to give you some tools and methods to do this. So let's start with increased predictability. Now, this is uh, a component from a medical device company that we were working with. And before we were using our design clarity techniques, you can see this is the component and this is when we modified it. Now, we have a practice of colouring the functional surfaces in green. So these are any surfaces that could potentially be active during the assembly or during the function process. In this case, all of these surfaces in green, nearly the entire component was potentially active. And if something's potentially active con contacting another component, it means we have to control it. It means we potentially have to measure it. It means we have to put a dimension on it. So we've removed a load of the dimensions here, but the corresponding dimensions between the two, we can see how many dimensions and tolerances we had to put on here. And then after doing some simple design clarity work, we can see now the number of functional surfaces and the number of tolerances we have to put on here. Now this equates to huge cost savings and time savings, and also risk savings when it comes to ramp up. Here's a picture of a scale drum from an injection device before using design clarity and then after. You can see the reduction in the number of tolerances are quite enormous. So I'm going to give you some, if you've got a piece of paper and a pen, now would be a good time to, uh, to get it out. But I'm going to give you some examples now of how you can apply some robust design thinking. There's two mechanisms here, A and B. How do they differ? Is one more robust than the other? So if you don't know that, that's okay, but you will do in a moment. So something that you need to know beforehand is the different degrees of freedom. So any component can constrain another in the Y, the X, and the Z translations. And then the RZ, the rotation about the Z axis, the rotation about the y-axis, and the rotation about the x-axis. So these are the six degrees of freedom. Any part can control another part in. You need to know that for this. So now we've got a little exercise for you. I have six assemblies here, a block on a flat plane. We have x, y, z, r, x, r, y, r, z. And I want you to put a score of 0 or 1 in each of these blocks to say whether it's 0 free or 1 unfree. Now, if we're talking about in the x-axis and we have a constraint on one side but not on the other, we call it an unfree. So it only has to be constrained in one direction on the axis. Okay? 
So have a go at uh, a few of these. Okay, so let's try, try and do a couple of these together now. We'll try to do this third one first. So is X free or unfree in this case? Uh, so it's actually unfree, so it's a one. So the orange block cannot move in the x direction here because it's constrained by this wall. So therefore it is unfree in the x. In the y, is it a 0 or a 1? In the z, 0 or 1? Rx? Ry? Rz? Yeah. Now, in this one here, what did you say the RY was? Free or unfree? One. It's one, yeah. Now, you can often think that, well, it shouldn't be free because I can still lift it and it can still rotate. But basically, it's a, so assuming we're pinning the center of its mass and then trying to rotate it. So in that case, it can't. And we'll just do one more. Let's do this final one here, number six. So in the X, is it 1 or 0? One. So we're trying to move the orange one in the X axis, and it can't do so. It's inside the uh, gray part. In the Y? Yeah. And in the Z? Well, it's a, a 1 there. So that's assuming there is a base at the bottom of this gray component. And the RX? RY One. and RZ. Zero. Yeah. There you go. So now you have the f fundamentals of kinematics. Now we'll move on to work out what the robustness of different mechanisms are. So in order to work out the mobility of a mechanism, we have to use the Kutzbach criterion. Uh, I'm going to leave out part of it today because it's just a bit too complicated to go into. But it's a very simple equation. The B, the mobility, is equal to 3 times by N, the number of links, minus 1, in brackets, minus the total number of unfreedoms in the mechanism. Now, the important bit to remember here is if B is 0, the mechanism is over-constrained or locked. If B comes out to equal to 1, then it's free. It's correctly constrained. And if B is equal to 2 or more, then it's under constrained. It means we don't have complete control over the mechanism. Now, when B is 1, it assumes we're going to drive it with a single motor or with a single actuator. Now, in many of your cases, you'll be doing static constructions. Therefore, the B should be 0. It requires no motors, and then it's correctly constrained. I've n never seen a construction that is correctly constrained, uh, to be honest, in, in civil engineering. 
nearly everything seems to be over constrained. So let's look at these two examples here. So I want you to work out the mobility B by N being the number of links or bodies. So how many links or bodies do we have in this, this one here? It's four. So we count the base as one as well. So we have one, two, three, four. And then the number of unfreedoms. So the total number of unfreedoms in all of the joints. Now we're just going to work with three degrees of freedom now. So X, Y, and RZ. So we're in a 2D world. So what I need you to do is using the same notation as before, where we have a zero for free and a one for unfree. For each of the links, we have X, Y, and R, Z. So let's take this link first. What are the unfreedoms in this joint here? What are the unfreedoms between this blue part and this orange part? So it's unfree in the X, it's unfree in the Y, but it's free in the RZ. What about in this one here? It's the same. So that is the constraints between this component and this component. And that would also be 1, 1, 0. So you use that to work out this part here, the sum of all the unfreedoms. So in these two joints here, we would have one, two, three, four unfreedoms. You work it out for the entire mechanism. So see if you can give me an answer for A, in terms of B, the mobility. Anyone got an answer? For what, the number of unfreedoms? No, for B. Uh, nope. B for A. So B is equal to 3 times by N minus 1 of unfreedoms. So what is N in this case? So 3 times 4 minus 1. And the number of unfreedoms, well, we've got two unfreedoms here, two here, two here, and two here. So how many unfreedoms do we have all together? So the score is? Okay. Is this correctly constrained? So a mobility of one means it's correctly constrained if we want to drive it with a single motor. Now tell me what the B value for the second mechanism is here, B. Should be quite easy for you to work out now. Everyone gets zero. So in that case, we have three times five minus one. Oh, is it five? Yeah, five minus one minus one, two, three, twelve. 
which is 0. OK, so that means this one is over-constrained. Therefore, it lacks predict predictability, it lacks robustness. Now, if you look at this, it's a bit like a scaled-down version of the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is horrendously over-constrained. This looks fine because everything's dimensioned perfectly. But just imagine what happens now if Will this move if we try to drive it around? Now, the point is, variation is ubiquitous. It's in every single construction we will ever make. And if it's not to begin with, once we load it, there will be. Once the sun is shining on it and the heat is expanding the metal, there will be variation. So what looks like this on the CAD model <coughs> is to a certain extent behaving like this in reality. Now, what happens when we produce a thousand of these? Well, it means that the motor driving this has a huge variation before the motor runs out. Or this bearing has 10% of the life in some cases and 100% of the life in other cases. Because everyone will have a slightly different variation in, which will mean the performance will change dramatically. This one won't. This is totally robust. It, if the variation occurs in this one, it will mean the motion path of this slightly changes. But the mechanism itself will be totally robust. Now, when we move into 3D, the problem gets worse. So we can have a simple wall bracket that looks like this with four components. And when you actually... Uh, fill in the matrix to say, okay, between, let's just take one example here, between W and Y, so this one here, we're constrained in the X, we're constrained in the Y, constrained in the Z, RX, RY, and just free in the RZ. So basically we've got 20 unfreedoms in this whole mechanism, and when you apply the 3D Kutzbach equation where you just replace the 3 with a 6, we get a mobility score of minus 2. So it's very over-constrained. Now, how many constraints do we need to take out of this to get it correct? Two. If we take two out, what will the B score be? Zero. Zero. So that will be still over-constrained. Mm. It needs to be one. If we want it to move. So we need to take three constraints out. And here's where the good bit comes. This is where very controlled creativity or synthesis comes in. Because I can literally knock out three of these ones and turn them into zeros. And it will guide me for how I need to create the mechanism in order to get a correctly constrained one. So I can go to this kinematic table of joints and just say, what type of joint do I need here? where there is a freedom in the R, X, R, Y, and R, Z. And what do I need here when I have a translation freedom in the Z and a rotation freedom in the R, Z? And then I can simply replace those two joints with other ones. Now, this has the same precision, or better precision, with complete predictability in how each one performs. It's not over constraint the components will last exactly the same time for each. Now let's go to one more step. So that is how to deal with mobility. This one's probably, this is called interface clarity now. This is another tool, very similar. But when we're fixing two components together, and you can think of it on a much bigger scale than this if you like, but imagine we're clipping a uh, battery pack here to the orange housing. And it's being clipped by two uh, grey pins going through the two holes in the housing. Now, when we clip 
a battery pack to the housing, do we want that to have any freedom or any mobility? In this case, we can assume not. We want it statically connected. So what we have to start by doing is defining the intended mobility. In this case, we don't want it to be able to move in the X, we don't want it to be able to move in the Y, and we don't want it to be able to rotate. Now here's our constraint set. In this interface clarity, we can go more than one. So how many constraints do we have between the orange component and the gray component in the X direction? So this single circle locked it in the X. And then we've added another one here. So we would say there's two constraints in the X here. In the Y, there's also two constraints in the Y. On the RZ, we can say this one pinned it, and then this one constrains the RZ rotation. So that's just a single RZ constraint. So the, we wanted a constraint set that looked like this. And what we've designed is a constraint set that looks like this. So we've over-constrained it. Now you think this might be fine, but that is a huge amount of extra cost into the fabrication and production. If you do a simple change, like a pin and a slot in this case, we now have a constraint set that looks a lot more like the one we intend. And what are the implications for that? Well, we do a simple tolerance analysis, and we can see that the worst case offset is actually half for this one, for the same tolerances, compared to this one. So that means you have to ask the component manufacturers to produce to the same quality, and we get double, double the equality on the assembly. Or you can say you produce to half the accuracy, and we'll end up with the same quality on the assembly level. These small geometric mistakes can make a big impact on the quality of the construction. Now, when we do our robust design training and work, we have, these are just two things that I've taught you so far, interface clarity and kinematics clarity. We actually have a full list of different tools and methods all the way across. By the way, how long have I, how long do I have? Um, about 15 minutes. Okay. So far, I've only taught you up to this line here about how to achieve more predictability. But all these tools and methods from this point onwards are about decreasing the sensitivity. So let's just look at a couple on decreasing sensitivity now. If we need to design a pen like an injection device, and I'll just give you a the really simple example about we need to design how much press on force for a lid. We have what's called a transfer function here. So on the vertical axis, we'll have the functional requirement. The functional requirement is the lid needs to have a press on force of 10 newtons. And on the x axis, we'll have the design parameter of the component that is varying. In this case, we say the diameter of the lid. Now what happens here is we dimension this so that 10 newtons will be achieved by an 8 millimeter lid. But we know when we produce these lids, they will never be exactly the same. They will vary in production with a distribution, let's just say a normal distribution in this case. And then based on this, which is the transfer function, that red line there is the physics that connects this lid to this base. We can say that a one millimeter increase in the lid diameter will lead to a 6.2 uh, Newton reduction in press on force. And a decrease of 1.1 millimeter will lead to a 9.1 Newton increase in press on force. Now, as we move to a more robust design, what do you think happens to this graph? Parameter, 
Ex very good. But how that is achieved is we're changing the geometry of the interface between the pen and the lid so that the line decreases in gradient. This means for the same ingoing variation, we get a much tighter performance output. Or we can flip the value the other way around. We have the same quality output, but we just allow a much bigger tolerance window to production. And that's basically what we're doing in robust design. Now you can say, how does that work for a pen lid? Well, it actually does work on a pen lid example. If you, if you have the housing here, And then we have the pen lid, which goes around it. I'm just going to accentuate the gap here. Now, if we have the pen lid changing by 1%, you can imagine in diameter, the press on force will change quite radically. But if we have a new design, Four is probably not the best, I'd rather three, but. If we have a new design with these local deformation zones, if we change the diameter, uh, the internal diameter of these points here, the press on force will not change anywhere near as much. So what we've effectively done just by putting local deformation zones, we've reduced the gradient of the transfer function. And you can do that in so many instances, in so many cases. <coughs> you can even make improvements to the Lego brick uh, based on this. And this gradient here is a sensitivity metric we call theta. Now, if we have a function requirement and a design parameter here, it's all very well asking production. We need to try and well, design, we need to try and reduce the gradient of this line, and production, we need to try and maintain this design parameter as much as we possibly can. But if we kind of pluck this target of 10 newtons out of thin air, what was the point in all this investment? So we need to make sure that we're actually designing to the right specification in the first place. To do that, we have something called a quality loss curve. And this basically links how much the functional requirement like press on force varies relative to the customer's satisfaction or how much quality loss do they experience. So a elderly arthritic patient may experience a huge amount of quality loss as we go above 15 newtons because they can no longer have the force to push on this pen lid. So the quality loss curve may look something like this. Now, to give a nice example of this, if you just consider these two vacuum cleaners, you might find it hard to see from over there, but we have vacuum cleaner A and B. Vacuum cleaner A, we can see that there is, uh, that this surface here is not aligned with this. It's not flush with it. This is downset compared to this one. The parallelity of these varies all the way around. So the gap here is huge. It's actually contacting here, it increases again here, increases again here. There's large aspects about how this looks, which look poor quality. And you're probably very familiar with this from the construction industry. If you just look at this one, it looks perfect quality. Now it looks perfect quality, even though that they vary just as much from the original specification. Why is that? Because we've offset this component here. It's actually quite a lot lower than these two, so we don't know. We say we're not visually sensitive to the variation. So what they've actually done in this case is, well, it's decoupling, yeah? Uh, that, that's a, that is actually the perfect terminology for it. Um, but we're also just reducing the, um, the gradient of the quality loss curve. So it means for large amounts of variation in the positioning of this black component, we experience virtually no quality loss. So the gradient would look like this. In this case, smaller variations of the positioning of the component leads to large quality loss to the customer. So we can see we drop away quite quickly. But how do you measure the customer satisfaction in terms of money? 
that good point so this bit is not at all an exact science but we tend to do it as what can the customer perceive so we we tend to run a bunch of different uh, prototypes to say at what point is the gap noticeable to you or the non-flushness noticeable or not and then we have some guidelines to say what's acceptable generally or not acceptable Let's say, you know, in, 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 there are some water others, and there is a construction, and then they ruin, and then and eventually the product doesn't work exactly like it's supposed to. So, in, in one way, if I've uh, done it better than it's cost of, you I've over invested. Yeah. But, uh, and, but when it's worse, I'm actually in the future going to pay more than what initially, you know. Good example. Yeah, that uh, front end calibration is really important. Say it again, sorry. The With a front defining what satisfaction looks like yes, exactly. to the customer is pretty important. Absolutely. And if you, if you had heat loss uh, from a building, as an example, that every single component that isn't flush or touching or overlapping is resulting in heat loss with a certain gradient. Mm -hmm. So the more overlapping it is, the, the less heat loss there is. And, the more, and we could calculate that in terms of efficiency of the building based on how much tolerance we need overlapping. But it's a whole mix of intrinsic quality cues to say, you know, that looks good quality to also how the building performs, to how well it can, easy it can be assembled. There's a lot of different things. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to go into the, uh, the curvature here. So it really depends on the situation. Sometimes you can use money to exactly. kind of be right with customer satisfaction, sometimes it's something well, in theory, it should all be able to be linked to money. Sometimes it's much harder, but um, usually <laughs> there's an intermediary step before it goes to money. And then also we, we can link from the design parameter to uh, a production process parameter like the mold temperature where we're molding this pen lid. If the variation in the ambient mold temperature varies, then it will lead to a variation in the diameter of the pen lid. So based on our framework, now we have a, a link all the way from the production process parameters through the design right the way through to how the customer perceives quality or the performance of the product in its use application. This is what we call the variation management framework. Uh, we publish this in quality engineering, but we've also used this to position a whole bunch of other journal and research articles, which we kind of place all around this framework depending on where the tools or methods are. We then built a demonstrator tool based on this. So we, we analyzed a, an anometer, which is a, a wind reader. And basically what you can do is uh, use the VMF framework to say, what is the overall customer satisfaction, which comes out in this box? And that is based on 100% minus the quality loss due to variation, which is resembled here. And that is determined by the variation of these functional parameters. So that is, in this case, for the wind reader, it is the precision of the wind reading and then the accuracy of the detection of direction of the wind. So it's, in other words, how fast it is and how uh, accurately it detects the direction. And the variation of those is resembled here. And the sensitivity of that variation to the quality loss the customer perceives is in this box. <coughs> then we can map those functional performance such as how accurately, accurately this wind reader measures wind speed is determined by this, 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 and so on, these design parameters. So in other words, this design parameter on this component will have this sensitivity to this functional performance. So you can imagine that any gap or any functional performance in your construction, you can link it to different design parameters in your tolerance chain. And then we can say, well, we, we split it into two things. One the top is the sensitivity, one is the contribution. We won't go into that. But then we can look at what design parameters do we want to maintain in-house and what do we want to outsource? 
So we can say all these ones can be adjusted at late stage because they're in-house and the rest are outsourced. So we've got no control over those. So this gives us a framework which we can manage variation. And then we can also do the same in our production processes. So the in-house ones are related to the process parameters we can control and the uncontrolled noise parameters in our production process. So now we have a, to a tool which we can manage variation and quality throughout the process. I'll just give you one final example here before I close. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Uh, in terms of the building, the, the number of apartments is, can increase to like thousands. It can. So what do you do then? You can. Do you break it down somehow? Hierarchical? So I think this is where you have to think about variation management and modularization in tandem. Usually you can modularize your design so that you can just take out a module in this framework. And then that functional parameter here might be one of the design parameters into the next level up of the modular construction. I think I will just give an example again. I like the energy efficiency of examples so can understand this a little bit. So energy efficiency is something that is actually tight to everything. Mm -hmm. Industrial building, like architecture, yep. the, the building services and the air systems, all these things. In that case, the number of parameters is, is, is so huge. It can be huge. Uh, it, it can be huge. The, the point I would say is, and sometimes even in product development companies with just, you know, products with six components, they're complaining about how big this might be. But the point is, you've done all of the calculations. You're dealing with all of these models and uh, simulations and design parameters all over the organization. They're actually already there. They're already there. So all you have to do is pull them together in one framework. I'm saying it's better that we all <coughs> face one point with regards to maintaining quality than all be in our little own local optimizations where we're optimizing against each other a lot of the time. Now, you can grow it as big as you want, and you can do it at a level of abstraction you want. So you can take, instead of a single dimension or design parameter here, you can take the performance of a module or of a sub-assembly. And then within that sub-assembly, you can have its own VMF, which is dealing with the components within that sub-assembly. In the construction industry, we often use a concept called level of development, okay. which is basically a level of decomposition. F exactly, yeah. So when, and I, I think you can apply the same methodology on different levels of decomposition. Right? You should be able to, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. So ideally, you should be able to double-click on this level of decomposition, and it will expand out to all of the relevant design parameters. Um, <clears throat> okay, I have one more point which fits in. Once we do all this, it, it puts us very much in line for the movement to Industry 4.0. So Industry 4.0, we have these interconnected uh, assembly lines, production lines, which can measure real-time the variation from each of the components, which means we can assemble it to almost zero variation or defect. A nice example of this was already been done for the iPhone 5. I still got that, this phone. Um, but the glass inlay here is basically inset into, I don't know if you can see it very well, uh, the aluminium base here. And basically, if you look at the quality of this assembly, it's absolutely amazing. There is, even with this funny profile, there is not a single gap you can detect all the way around the edge. Now, the way they achieve that is, of course, tight tolerances anyway, but then just to go <coughs> a step above, which Apple typically will do, they then put 725, it's probably some statistics for that, I'm not sure what they are, glass inlays down. Then they will take a high-resolution camera image of the aluminium body, and of those 725 glass inlays and find out which of those most closely matches the variation of the aluminium body. He then picks that and puts it in place. And I noticed in the, the new iPhone, I can't remember what, it, what it's called, but the, the one that takes this old housing, um, do you know what it's called? The, the is it a, sorry? The X? No. The, um, the BBC? There's a new launch of, a, they've launched the iPhone X, but then, but there's also the, uh, 
the model, the new model, which uses this uh, form and size, uh, AC. AC. And I've looked at those, and the variation in the glass in, around the glass inlay is much, much larger because they've put it as a, a lower quality version model and they've obviously just got rid of this process step. So they're able to sort of control the quality at the level of which they want. Uh, at this time, this was their premium product. They have this. I think when they move to this new uh, version, which is the lower quality product, they've just got rid of this step. Anyway. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, if you want to contact me about anything or run a collaborative project, uh, I'm uh, happy to be contacted. And if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? All clear. I'm kind of an abstract one. We're in, in, in construction. We're moving away from a customized stick build to an adjusted aeration from the field, which feels a little bit like the glass matching the yeah. aluminum. We're, we're moving toward more panelized and bigger components, and that's triggering all these misalignments with level four slabs. Mm -hmm. So it feels, in, in hearing the I-4.0, it feels a little bit like, well, we've just, we're trying to leave that behind. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? It's, it's not really a question, more just kind of a curiosity. Yeah, what, when I'm working in uh, the medical industry, we're producing uh, injection devices with maybe 20 components, which we're producing a billion of them a year. And the components are produced in four different countries around the world. And every single one of those components has to be interoperable, meaning you can take the components are not on one assembly line, which you can just make sure this one fits to this one. It means we have to control every single component with extremely tight tolerances because when they're thrown together in automated assembly, this pen needs to inject the right amount of drug so it doesn't kill the patient and meets FDA standards. In those instances, we don't want any adjustment or at all at the later stages. In some instances, like the construction, of course, why not do some adjustment? But you need to have it done in a way that is the right decoupled manner. So uh, another thing a presentation I got is axiomatic design, <coughs> which is one of our other tools. Because you can be in a situation where you're adjusting like a Rubik's Cube. You can be adjusting one surface, which all looks fine, and we're just here, and then something else is out. Okay. And then you have to adjust this, and that's when you're doing adjustment wrong in a non-robust, non-predictable way. So adjustment is fine, you just need to know exactly how much adjustment you need and exactly what sequence of adjustment you need to do and exactly what functions those adjustments will affect. Because usually somebody's doing adjustment for one purpose and it's throwing another purpose out and we need to avoid that. So I'm absolutely fine with adjustment, it just needs to be built into the design, not done as an afterthought. Well, that's why you're a couple of design now. Anyway, so the axiomatic design, in, in axiomatic design, you have, you have two axioms. Yeah. And one of them is the independence axiom, and then the other one is the information. The information one I understand better. Can you explain the independence axiom? How do you actually, you know, in practical terms, achieve that in the design of new products like this? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, wait, uh, no, it's not on this memory stick. It, it happens all the time uh, I mean so uh, just to, um, it's not well absolutely everything I mean um, if you imagine um, if you just I'm trying to think of a simple construction uh, angle if you imagine a, a hinge on the bottom of the door well that the position of that hinge on the, the bottom of the door may affect the the flushness of the door to the one side it may also affect the height of the lock position compared to the adjacent lock. That would be a, an example of a, so I, I feel like I'm not talking to the whole audience here because they don't know axiomatic design. Uh, the simplest <coughs> thing about, and then I'll answer your question. If you imagine a tap, um, fuck, how am I gonna do this? Yeah. A typical British tap system. Well, we 
hot tap and cold tap. Uh, now, we have two function requirements here when we're filling up the, the vessel. Function requirement one is flow rate. And functional requirement two is temperature. So maybe we're not uh, filling a vessel, we're washing our hands from the taps. Exactly. So we turn them on and the temperatures, uh, we turn them on and we get the flow rate right, but we realize it's too hot. So then we have to turn the cold tap on more. And now we've got the right temperature, but it's gushing out too fast because it's, this is a typical coupled design. This is when two of our functional requirements, two of our functional requirements here are influenced by a single design parameter. So you can see in this case we're not coupled because if we adjust this design parameter it only affects this function. If we adjust this design parameter it only affects this function. Where we have the matrix filled on both cells then we've got a problem because we adjust this function to achieve this and it fucks up this one. And this is what I meant by the Rubik's Cube. A Rubik's Cube is a perfect example because yeah, well, you can do something called decoupling. This again, more to advanced axiomatic design, which is even when you coupled, you can do it in the right sequence and you can make it act like a decoupled design. But if it's truly uncoupled, it means you can adjust in any sequence to get the right performance. Uh, axiom two is the information reduction axiom. And that is basically to try and say, in order to maintain this functional requirement, we want as few parameters influencing it as possible. Now, if you remember the example I gave with the green surfaces about the reduction in number of dimensions, that's basically axiom two. That's trying to get rid of as many influencing parameters as possible. That's going from a four-legged chair to a three-legged chair. This means we don't have to control expensively all of these different parameters and dimensions. So all of this work is underpinned by axiomatic design, those two axioms. So I don't know, I'll <laughs>